church, I invite everyone to stand on their feet in the honor of the word of God. Our sermon this week is taken from Psalm 8, verse 1 to 9. Let's read together in the count of three. One, two, three. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes, to steal the enemy and the stranger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of the man you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Do you guys need to see it? We have extra help on the kids' ministry as well. Uh, so thank you for everyone who stepped in. Can we just give thanks to them? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And for the next couple of weeks as well. But starting next week, I think we should start to see some of the first row people start coming back, hopefully. All right. So if you guys are watching the first row people, let me just say I miss you. Please don't be too comfortable in your holiday. Come back soon. Now today, we are in our second week of our series, Healing Psalms, that we started last week. So the idea behind this series, we actually want to explore some common problems that people face in their walk with God and show how the psalmists deal with those problems. Okay? Remember what last week we talked about? We talked about doubt, right? So Edric was talking about doubt last week. And today, we're going to talk about a very specific issue that I think is very um, important for us to understand, and that is the issue of self-worth. Now, do you guys know what I mean by self-worth? Okay? We need to be in page, on page first, on the same page, on what is self-worth. Self-worth is the internal sense of one's own value and worth as a person. So it's what we feel, think, and believe about ourselves. And this question of self-worth is a question that all of us must answer. It's not an option. Because you and I, we cannot live without knowing our self-worth. Because we want our life to matter, right? We want to feel valued. So the question is not whether you have self-worth or not. All of us have self-worth. The question is, what is our self-worth and how do we get it? And our culture especially is obsessed with the question. Because if you read online and click on Google self-worth or self-esteem, you will find things like this. Okay, I'll give you a couple of examples. Lose weight and you will find yourself liking yourself more. Have you, have you read that before? Or make more money and you, will mo- you feel more confident about yourself. Or this one, exercise regularly, and you will feel good about yourself. Or maybe this one, get a plastic surgery, and, okay, you know the drill. So we have all these lists on how to build our self-worth. But I think the problem is we don't ask the question far enough, because we don't ask the question, why? Okay, you said that losing weight makes me feel better about myself, but why does losing weight make me feel better about myself? Why does having more money make me me feel more confident about me? Because all of us, we have things that if we have it, we feel like we are somebody. All of us must have that. The problem is not all of us have the right answer. So before we look at the right answer, I want us to explore the wrong answer that the culture offers us. Because Timothy Keller offers us three wrong premises that the world uses to define our self-worth, okay? So this is all him, not me. He's a really smart guy. And the first one that he says this, the first wrong premise is, I am what I have. So basically, this approach says, the more that I have, the more I feel better about myself. And the question is, what do you want to have? 
Well, some people say I won't have more money. Some say I want power. Some say I want love. Well, everyone wants a different thing. But the point is, if we get that very thing, if we get what we want, then we feel valuable. But if we don't get what we want, then we feel like we are nobody. Well, the question is, does this premise work? Think about it. What happens if you define your self-worth by how much money you have? Here's what happens. You will work so hard. You will do everything you can to have more money. Am I right? But what happened at the end of it? Let me tell you what happened. You lose yourself. Because by making money your self-worth, you will have more money, but you will have less of yourself. And some of you are like, you're a pastor. You don't know anything about money. That's true. Let's look at one of the people out there who's very successful. Look at their life. I guarantee you. When you look at their life, they might achieve everything that you want to achieve. They might have everything that you want to have. But when you look at their life, what we see is a lot of brokenness. You with me on that? What you see is someone who's addicted to drugs, alcohol, mess up family. And when they're interviewed by Oprah, I mean, what's happened to you? you know, what's wrong with you? They are at the top and they feel empty at the same time. And you know what they say? Here's what, what they always say. I regret. I did not spend more time with my family. I regret I did not do this, I did not do that. What happened? Because in defining their self-worth by how much they have, what happened is they feel less about themselves. It does not work. The second premise, and this is a very strong one, it's not I am what I have, but I am what I feel. So this premise say what's important in life is not what you have, but what you feel. Okay? You probably hear it expressed in something like this. I need to follow my heart. Have you heard that before? I need to follow my feeling because at the end of the day, what matters is me following my heart. I don't care what other people tell me what to do. It's my life. I need to follow my life. My heart, sorry. What is wrong with this view? Let me tell you what is wrong with this view. Our feeling is very unreliable. Okay? Like... Our feeling changes all the time depending on our circumstances. What we feel right now is not necessarily what we feel tomorrow. Our feeling changes all the time. And that is why it's ridiculous for us to say, if we meet a boy who feels like they're a girl, then there must be a girl trapped in a boy's body. Isn't that what our culture tells us today? But feeling changes all the time. And here's the most important thing about feeling. If I look at my feeling right now, here's what happened. I feel different things at the same time, and they are contradictory. Let me give you an example. If you do not know my life, I am on constant 24-7 diet. Okay? My life is marked by diet, 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 never-ending diet. So me, why, what's the reason I'm doing that? Because I feel like I need to lose weight. But at the very same time, I have this feeling called, I feel like eating KFC. Now, how many of you guys realize that these two feelings, they don't go along, right? Yet, at the same time, I feel both. So the question is, well, okay, yes, then which one do you feel like the most? Well, it depends. On Monday, I feel like losing weight. That's why I exercise. But on Tuesday, because I already exercised on Monday, I feel like KFC. So that means my feeling is not reliable. And therefore, we can't define our self-worth by our feeling. It doesn't work. And the third premise, and probably the strongest premise of all is, I am whatever I say I am. So these premises say there's no such thing as absolute right and wrong. So everyone have the right to define who they are based on whatever it is, and they have the right to say this is who they are, and no one can say no to them. Okay, so basically people say this, don't let anyone tell you who you are. You have the right to define who you are. We have the freedom to define our own self-worth. And no one, no one can say no to us. Isn't this very appealing, guys? I mean, it's good, right? This is my life. I get to define it however I want. But let me tell you. Yes, it is appealing. But it is impossible to live this way. Let me give you an example. LGBTQ plus movement, okay? So the premise between... Uh, behind the LGBTQ+, LGBTQ plus movement is this. Everyone is equal, 
and they are free to define themselves however they want. And no one can say no to them, right? So everyone is free. You can define yourself however you want. It is your right. Here's my question. What happens when people with this view encounter a true Christian? So let's say someone with LGBTQ plus belief, they come to RSI today and they hear me preach. Homosexuality is a sin. You need to repent. Do you know what they will, how they will react? They're not going to say, okay, that's your belief, that's fine. No, they won't. You know what they will do? They will say that I'm a bigot. They will say that my view is wrong and they will oppress me because of it. Do you see what happened? In one sense, they said freedom, equality. In one sense, they cannot stand me holding to my Christian view. So there's no such thing as freedom and equality. They cannot stand me being me. Because as soon as they encounter someone who disagrees with them, their self-worth is threatened and they feel like they must attack the other person. Impossible to live this way. So these are the three main premises on how the world defines self-worth. I am what I have. I am what I feel. I am whatever I say I am. And none of them works. It might work for a season, but it does not work consistently and coherently. So that means our self-worth will continue to fluctuate. There's days that we feel happy about ourselves. There's days that we feel like we are nobody. But do you realize there's a common thread behind all these premises? Anyone realize that? Is this. They all tell us to find our self-worth by looking within. Now, but listen, I don't know about you, but when I look at myself, when I discover who I really am and what I really like, it doesn't actually make me feel good about myself. Anyone? Right? When I look at myself, it actually fills me with more disappointment and concern because here's what I found. No one lied to me, hurt me, and disappointed me more than me. No one. So looking at myself to find my self-worth, it's only lead me to despair. And some of you are like, okay, but you know, what matters is how I feel. It's not. Because think about it. You might be stubborn and persistent. You might feel like, this is who I am. I don't need anybody to tell me who I am. This is who I am. But let me tell you why you do that. You do that because you believe that you are right. And you hope that one day when people see the way you see, that you will receive their approval. In other words, none of us, none of us can give value to our own. We need outside affirmation to tell us, you're doing good. We need someone to tell us, you're doing great. What you did is awesome. I'm proud of you. And that is why the Bible gives us radically different answers. You with me so far? So I'm giving you the wrong premises of the world in order for me to show you how the Bible defines self-worth. So today, we're going to look at a Psalm 8. And this Psalm is written by King David, and it's a Psalm that prays the majesty of God. And at the same time, this Psalm deals with the question of self-worth. But it deals with the question of self-worth very differently from the world. Because if the world tells us to look within, Psalm 8 will tell us to look up. Some else would tell us that you can only find your word when you look up. Because here's what we find. The Bible glued the word of self-word to the word of God. We will only know our true self-word to the degree we know the majesty of God. You and I, we can only know who we are when we know who God is. And the more we see the word of God, the more we see our word. Who we are is determined by who God is. And every problem in life, every problem, doesn't matter what it is, is rooted in two things. In not knowing who God is or in forgetting who God is. You with me so far? So let's jump into Psalm chapter 8, okay? I have three points. The majesty of God, the frailty of humans, the glory of human. Let's look at the first one. The majesty of God. Psalm 8, verse 1 to 3. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heaven. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foe to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heaven, the work of your finger, the moon and the star, 
which you have set in place and will continue later. So the psalm begins with this wonderful sentence, and that is, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now in English, they separate the Lord and Lord into one in caps, one in small letter. But in Hebrew, it's actually two different words. The one in caps is actually the name of God in the Bible. You remember what happened when Moses encountered the burning bush? Moses asked God, God, what is your name? And you know what God says? I am who I am, which is translated in the Bible as Yahweh. And the word Yahweh means this, that God is bigger than the present, past, and future. It means that God never ceases to be, and God cannot be measured with time because God lives outside of time. He has no beginning. He has no end. And he depends on nothing, and everything else depends on him. That's the meaning of the word Yahweh. I am who I am. But then the second Lord is actually the word Adonai, which means ruler or a king. So David says this, O Yahweh, our king, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So he's saying this, that Yahweh majesty, there's not a millimeter on earth where God's name, Yahweh's name, is not majestic. He's greater, wiser, more beautiful, more wonderful than everything, everywhere, and he has no competitors. But here's what's amazing about that. That God is not only a God out there somewhere in the universe. David say, that God is our God. Which means that we are in an intimate relationship with Him. How amazing is that? But look at verse 3. And this is very, very bewildering. When I look at your heavens, the work of what? The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Now, this is really cool. So when David looked at heavens, and when he looked at the stars and the moons and the sky, first of all, he acknowledged, well, hold on a second, this cannot be an accident. This is too good for it to be happened just by accident. There must be a creator. So now, when David looked at the heaven, David does not say the moon, the star, and the skies, they are the works of God's hand, even though that's true. You know what David say? They are the work of God's finger. Now think about it. At the time of David, they do not have telescope. Can you see where I'm going with this? That means what David knows about the universe out there is only what he can see with his own eye. It's only what he can see with his visible eye. So that means if we talk with David today, hey David, what do you think about the Milky Way? He will reply, the what? There's a way that's filled with milk? Because he does not even know a fraction of what we know today. And yet, with the little that he knows, he's amazed by who God is. How much more for us? Let me put it this way. If our galaxy, the Milky Way, is the size of Australia, then our solar system will be the size of a cup of water. And the earth will be the size of a speck of dust that is barely visible. And do you know where you and I? It will take another million years for them to invent a microscope that can detect you and I. And today, science tells us that our galaxy, our Australia, is just one of the billion galaxies out there. Which tells us the universe is far bigger than what we can com comprehend. And yet God created them with what? With his fingers. Creating the universe is like child play to God. He did not even break a sweat. And now the question, if God's fingers can do that, how big is God? No wonder Chris Tomlin said what? How great is our God? But look at verse 2. And this is the first that just wow me. First two, David says this, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foe to steal the enemy and the avengers. So apparently this great God has enemies. I don't know why anyone will actually make enemies out of God, but he does. He does have enemies. So the question is, how does God deal with his enemy? God says, I mean, David says that God silenced his enemies, you know, through what? To the babbling and chatter of babies and infants. Now, doesn't that make you ask a question? I mean, 
what kind of God deal with his enemy by saying, let the babies pay for it? Parents, let me put it this way. Let's say someone break into your house late at night while you're at home. Do you tell your two years old to deal with it? Hey, El, can you cry as loud as you can so that he might get panic and leave the house? No, you don't. Probably the husband, or prob- the husband probably say, Mommy, why don't you deal with the guy? We don't do that. We don't let babies deal with enemies. Why? Because babies cannot do anything. Are you agree? And yet, God says, David says, what comes out of baby's mouth is how God deals with his enemy. With another word, God is showing off his strength. He's using the weakness of babies and even to silence his enemy. To tell us, this is how majestic God's name is. And this is the pattern that we see all the way throughout the Bible. God always reveals his majestic name by using weak people to do his great works. Why? Because when we see babies defeat tunnels, there's no doubt who gets the glory. When God used weak people to the great and mighty thing, God makes his name majestic because there is no doubt it is his power that does the work. God makes his name majesty to the weakness of the weak. This is how great God is. Now, let me give you one quick implication before we move on to talking about us. If what David says is true, if God created this expanding universe simply with his fingers, then the implication is this. You don't mess with him. You don't mess with him. I mean, we can't live however we want because we have to honor the creator who created us and everything in it. If God created us, it means that he owns us and we must listen to him. It means that we can only f- find our reason for existence, our purpose in life, our word in God. On the other hand, what happens if we remove God from the equation? What happens if David look at the heaven and say, I look at the fastness of the universe, I look at the moon and the stars and the sky, and they are simply a product of accident. You know what it means? It means we have no purpose. It means if everything is the product of accident, if everything just happened to be, it means you and I are simply a piece of junk. You and I have no value. We're just a combination of molecules that happen to come together in a certain way. Something only has value if it can be used, if it has design, and it fulfills a purpose. But if you and I are simply a product of accident, then you and I have no self-worth. It means it does not matter how you live your life. You can be really good or you can be a serial killer. In the words of theologian by the name of Lincoln Park, he says this, I try so hard and got so far, but in the end, it does not even matter. Because you and I absolutely have no meaning in life if there's no God. And here's the point, right? No one can live this way. Even atheists, they try to find meaning in life. They want something to give their life value. But they try to remove God out of the equation. And let me tell you, the moment you do that, there's absolutely no ground for you to say that your life matter. Absolutely none. So if you say there's no God, then you have to accept the fact that you and I are simply a piece of junk. That's the bad news. But the good news is David say, there is a creator God. And we can see his fingerprints in creation. And the universe is not a product of accident because God has set everything in their place. Therefore, if that's true, you and I can have hope in finding our self-worth. What is our self-worth? Let's look at the second point. The frailty of human, verse 3 and 4. When I look at your heavens, the work of your finger, the moon, and the star, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Now, anybody ever 
you know, get out there, probably uh, somewhere in the, you know, in a mountain, look at the sky, the blue sky, look at the stars, look at the, you know, all these beautiful skies, and feel insignificant. Anyone know what I'm talking about? When you look at that beautiful scenery and you feel like, I feel I'm so small. Who am I? I'm nothing. I think none of us in our right mind can say, when we have that scenery, I don't think any one of us can say, well, geez, the galaxy is so lucky to have a guy like me in it. I am so awesome. No, right? Because when we see the greatness of God in creation, here's what we find. We find ourselves extremely small in comparison. And this is David's point. The point is clear. God is infinitely great, and we are far smaller than a speck of dust in comparison. <laughs> and let me tell you, before we get into our value and our word, we must embrace this truth first. Because unless we acknowledge our smallness, you and I will not be amazed by God's greatness. Because the bigger we see God, the smaller we see ourselves. And maybe the reason why we think we are big it's because we do not see that God is big. We think we are more than who we really are. So at the beginning of this psalm, first of all, David reminds us, hold on a second, no, 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 you are very small. I am very small. You are very tiny. You are less than a speck of dust in comparison to God. And yet David did not stop there. Yes, we are small and insignificant. But this is what blew David's mind. The God of the universe is not simply aware of us. He is mindful of us and He cares for us. So the God of the universe who made the universe with His finger, He actually focuses His attention on us. We are the object of God's attention. And here's why we must embrace our smallness. Because unless we realize that we are small, the more we see our smallness, the more we can see how big, how good, how caring, how awesome God is toward us. I mean, do you realize this? That deep inside of us, there's a strong desire to be noticed. Anyone? Anyone realize that? Parents, don't you see this in your kids all the time? Right? Daddy, daddy, watch this. Mommy, mommy, watch this. I'm going to make a big jump into the pool. So you, being a good parent, you look at them and make that jump into the pool. And then they say again, Daddy, watch this. Mommy, watch this. I'm going to make a big jump into the pool. So you look at them again, thinking that they might do a different jump, but it is the exact same jump again. Daddy, watch this. Mommy, watch this. And it is the exact same jump for the eighth time. Any parents know what I'm talking about? Daddy, watch this. Mommy, watch this. And you are very tempted to say at this moment, seriously, how much affirmation do you need? I've watched you do that jump for 10 times. But of course, being a good parent you are, you don't say that. Instead, what you say, oh, wow, that is one good jump. Keep it up while checking your Instagram. Children want attention. And we assume they will eventually grow out of it. But they don't. How do I know? Because we don't. All of us have desire to be noticed. All of us want attention. And if we can't get good attention, we'll do something bad to get attention. Because why? Because we need to know, we are desperate to know that we are in someone's mind. That someone is mindful of us and someone care for us. And let me be very honest about my feeling. There is no worse feeling than leaving to Indonesia for a few weeks and realizing that no one in RSI misses me. Who needs Josie? We have Edric. He preached the same gospel and shorter, right? I might as well leave and went back to Indonesia for good if that's the case. But what David says is, our spouse might not notice us. Our lover might not remember us. Our parents, our friends, our church might forget us. But David say, but the greatest being 
in the universe does not. We might be smaller than speck of dust, but His mind is filled with us. God thinks of us. God gazes at us. God smiles at the thought of us because we are precious in His eyes. And let me put it in a different word. So that means, God does not only think that we are precious, He buys us flowers to express it. That's what God does. And at this moment, you start to feel like, oh my gosh, I am so precious. I am somebody. No. Because David is really clear. We are extremely small. God is infinitely great. It is the great mystery of the universe that this great God of the universe loves us so greatly. It is a big, big mystery. Which led us to my last point. The majesty of God, the glory of Him. Verse 5 to 9. Yet you have made Him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned Him with glory and honor. You have given Him dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under His feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the path of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all Follow the sequence, okay? Follow the sequence of Psalm 8. First, David said, God is so great. And the heaven declare his glory. He is greater than our greatest imagination. And in comparison to God, we are almost non-existent. Yet, God is mindful of us. Yet, God cares for us. And that is not the end. And then David goes on to say in these verses that this great and wonderful God has made us the apex of creation. He made us a little lower than heavenly beings, and He crowned us with glory and honor. What does it mean? It means we, who are smaller than speck of dust, we are elevated to the position of royalty, where God gave us dominion over the work of His hand, over the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, and the fish of the sea. Okay? Just fun question. Does it sound familiar to you? If you've been in our church for a couple of years, you should say yes. Otherwise, Pastor Sam will be very sad. Because this comes from Pastor Sam's favorite verse, Genesis 1, 27 to 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is what theologians call Imago Dei. You and I are created in the image of God, where God made us the head chief of all creation. We are given dominion to rule as God's representative. So in other words, here's what's happening. God made us for Him. And God made the creation for us. We are given dominion. And we are to exercise that dominion over the rest of creation. Yet at the same time, we are accountable to God in the way we use our dominion. We are to image God in the way we exercise our power. Okay? So let me sum up Psalm chapter 8 before I give you three quick applications and then we're done. So here's what Psalm chapter 8 tells us about our self-worth. We are precious and glorious. We are extremely valuable, but not because we are precious, not because we are glorious. We are very small, but someone think we are precious. Someone crown us with glory and honor. Someone give us dominion. Someone make us the apex of creation. Someone created us in his image. This destroy, destroy the world concept of self-worth. Because here's what we must get. Our self-worth does not begin with I, but God. We are not what we have. We are not what we feel. We are not whatever we say we are. We are who God says we are. That's how we define our self-worth. You with me so far? Now, 
Let me give you three quick applications of Imago Day. There's many, but I'm just going to give you three for the sake of time. The first one, if this is true, if we are created in the image of God, that means there's a psychological implication. Because it means it does not matter what your heart says about you. It does not matter what's the evaluation of other people. See, there's a rock-solid objective significant and glory about us. Because we are infinitely valuable to God no matter who we are, no matter what we have done, and no matter how we are living our life right now. The world tells us that we are valuable as long as we perform well. Am I right? But the Bible tells us that we have worth because we are made in the image of God. Which means we can stop looking affirmation for affirmation from other people. Because God notices us. He thinks of us and He cares for us. And if the God of the universe value us, then my question is, who cares about what other people think about us? Let me put it in our everyday language. We are not valuable because we have many followers in Instagram. We can have 4,000 followers or we can have four. Dad, mom, brother, sister. Our value does not depend on how many people that actually like us. Our value does not depend on education. Our value does not depend on our appearance. You can be tall, not so tall, not so short, or in the word, samapai. Sameta tak sampai. You can be preacher. You can be a cleaner. You can be a chef. You can be a taxi driver. You can be a student. Or you can be unemployed. None of it determine our self-worth because our worth is built on the unchanging fact that we are created in God's image but not only psychological implication but the second thing if we understand Imago Day it has enormous social implication because it means there's not a single person out there who are simply ordinary there should not be any caste system, any class system, or racism. Because one person is not more valuable than other people. It doesn't matter how poor or rich that person is. The poorest beggar on the street is every bit as valuable as the richest person in the palace. Because everyone is created in the image of God and every individual is valuable. As much as our value do not be, not, are not defined by anything we do, other people's value are not defined by what they do because they are God's reflection as much as we are. If that's true, then we should respect and honor each other and look at everything through God's lens. We don't honor people more because of their background or because they fit our preference. Because the child of a prostitute is as valuable as the child of a king. All people from all nations, from all classes, from all background are precious in the eyes of God. And the third one, and the most important one, it also has spiritual implication. Think about it. We are made to image God's glory and to express the beauty of God to everyone around us, which tell us we are not light bulbs. We are mirrors. A mirror cannot produce light and beauty on its own, right? Because light and beauty are not inherent in a mirror. A mirror is only filled with light and beauty if it faces something with it. So that means it doesn't matter how hard we stare at the mirror, a mirror cannot change Mr. Bean into Brad Pitt. And this is the way John Piper put it. I love it. Man is given the exalted status of image bearer. Not so he would become arrogant and autonomous, but so he would reflect the glory of the maker. Now, do you know what it means? Here's what it means. It means we will never get a sense of our word on our own. We will never feel that we are somebody just by looking at inside and say, I am somebody, I am somebody, I am somebody. We cannot generate value on our own. 
we will never have word unless we are facing someone who is giving us word. Someone has to say to us, you are great, you are valuable, you are precious. Something outside of us has to give it to us because we can't generate from within. And here lies the problem with us. Here's the problem. Our problem in life is we're looking at the wrong things to give us self-worth. What do we look at? We look at romance. We look at achievement. We look at our family. We look at our spouse. We look at status, achievement, success. And they're not wrong. They're good. But none of us can give us what our heart really needs because you and I are created to image the very glory of God. So if we build our self-worth on how we do financially, what happens when we do poorly? We're not just unhappy, no. We lose our worth. If we build our worth on how much we are loved by someone we love, what happens if we break up? We're not just sad. We lose our worth. Whatever it is that we build our self-worth on but God is extremely fragile. Only God can give us our true self-worth because we are made in the image of God. Now, can you see now how some eight give us a radically different answer to self-worth? Because the world tells us you can generate it on your own. Look within. You matter because you matter. But the Bible says, uh uh the Bible answers the question of self-worth by pointing us to who God is. It's not about who we are. It's about who God is. And the more majestic God is on, in our mind, the more we see His greatness, the more we see our self-worth. Because our self-worth is tied up to the revelation of who God is. That's how we find our self-worth. However, there's one big problem. So if we stop at Psalm chapter 8, we look at this wonderful Psalm, and we start to think, oh, wow, this is actually very glorious. This is really good. But here's lies the problem. When we look at ourselves, we don't see it. Because rather than reflecting God's image, we often make a mess of God's image. We fail to bear God's image. We fail to reflect His glory. And we will look at our society today. Can we agree if we look at the newspaper, it doesn't look happy. It looks really bleak. There's war happening everywhere. There's murder. There's theft. There's robbery. And not only that, but then we also saw and witnessed the destructive power of creation. Hurricanes, storm, flood, earthquake, volcano. And if you're some eight, you know, we are supposed to have dominion over lions. We are supposed to subdue lions. But let me ask you, what do we do if we meet a lion out of its cage today? Do we exercise our dominion over lion? Lion, I command you, sit and be a good cat. No, right? What do we do? We run. Why? What happened? I thought Psalm 8 said we have dominion over creation. Yes. But let me tell you other story. The fall happened. The sin of Adam and Eve has turned creation upside down. So now, rather than having dominion over creation, we are controlled by creation. Rather than reflect God's glory, we live for our own glory. So the image of God in us right now is tainted and broken. So how do we restore this? So if you just come out of the sermon and say, all right, I'm going to go home. I'm going to tell myself, I must seek the glory of God. I must reflect the glory of God. That's good. But it's useless. Because that's abstraction. It does not do any good to our self-worth. Because we need to see the fulfillment of the glory of God elsewhere. And Hebrew 2 actually solved the problem for us. Hebrew 2, verse 6 to 9. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? 
you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Now, let's read verse 9 together in count of three. One, two, three. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely who? Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now, this is what the author of Hebrew does. He quote Psalm chapter 8. So he quote this wonderful psalm that talked about the glory of man, and then he switched the focus and said, first and foremost, before it's all about you, it's all about Jesus. Jesus is the perfect image of God. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is God in his fullness of his glory. But then, you know what Jesus did? He left his glory. Jesus came to us, and for a little while, he was made a little lower than angels. He became just like us. And he lived the life that we should have lived. And then he died the death that we should have died. Why? Because someone need to pay for the broken image that we have caused. Someone need to pay for the consequences of sin that we have caused. And the glorious God became man, became one of us to die for our sin. And not only that, but then he's resurrected. And right now, Jesus is seated on his throne. And we have yet to see everything under his control. But even though we have yet to see everything under his feet, we know that he's already crowned with glory and honor. The king is sitting on his throne. And it's only a matter of time before he returns to us and restore everything that is broken. So that means, let me conclude now. That means Psalm chapter 8, before it is about us, is first and foremost about Jesus. But when you see Jesus has fulfilled everything Psalm 8 talks about, when you see the glory of God lose His glory for us, when we see Jesus, the infinitely beautiful one, lose His beauty for us, when we see the most glorious thing in the universe lose His glory, that is our glory. The ultimate glory is to see Jesus losing His glory for us so that we could have it. Because when we see that, Jesus becomes our glory. So that means today, when we try to define our self worth, we're going to see our self worth with two eyes visible eyes and the eyes of faith. With our visible eyes, when we try to look at ourselves, we'll find here's what we find we find that we are very small. We find that we are broken. We find that we are sinful people. That's what we see with our visible eye. But when we look at our self worth to the lions of faith, is what we see. We are small. And yet, Jesus is mindful of us. Jesus cares for us. And because of Jesus today, you and I, we are crowned with glory and honor. We are adopted into the family of God, and we are called royalty. And now, we do not need other people to tell us that we are somebody, because Jesus already tells us that we are somebody. We know who we are. We belong to Jesus. And to make us know how much we were to him is what he does. He paid the infinite cost at the cross. The cross is the cost and the word of our life to Jesus. So if we understand this, if he died at the cross to pay for our sin, then you and I understand now how precious we are to him. So how do we find our self-worth? His help. Look at the glorious one, the most glorious being in the universe, losing his glory so that you and I can receive his glory. If we see that, then we know we are worth the cross to Jesus. That is our self-worth. If that's true, we do not need other peoples to give us any, any affirmation 
because Jesus has told us he already given us his affirmation. The cross is our word to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you would send your only son to tell us how much we work to you. That you would surrender the most beloved son to die at the cross. To know that we are precious in your eyes. To know that we are valuable. And that's why we find our self-worth today. So today, if there's any of us in this place, God, that if we still try to find our self-worth in anything else but you, if we still try to play this game that try to justify our existence by how much we have, by what we feel, by what we say we are, forgive us, Lord. We come into your throne in repentance and acknowledging, Lord, that we are nobody. Forgive us for trying to prove that we are somebody outside of you. And I pray that today we are reminded of the beauty of the cross that tells us that we are somebody because Jesus died for you. And I pray that the beauty of the gospel is not just something that we know in our head, but I pray that it will sing in our heart. We do not need to look to other affirmation. We do not need to find our own value because you have given us the infinite value and you have shown us our value at the cross. So help us, Lord, because we are tempted to find our value in everything else by you every day. But I pray that we continue to look to the cross and find our self-worth at the foot of the cross. And we ask this in the name of your son, beloved son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.